Um, you are in Field Guide to Caring for a Developer 2.0. Uh, your speaker is Allison Tarr. Uh, Allison is a feminist and introvert, and a front end developer who openly discusses her struggles with mental health. She loves rock and roll, hula hoops, and Dolly Parton, not necessarily a member. As a result of her own lived experience combating stigma, Allison encourages a more open conversation to provide additional resources to create safe spaces and sustainable spaces. Uh, now working as an independent developer, she's been able to consciously choose better health while advocating for change in how the tech industry approaches mental health and burnout. So please join me in welcoming Allison Tarr. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining me at the end of the day. I know had a lot of absorption of material, a lot of interaction. I know, as you mentioned, I'm an introvert, so it's like, we made it, everybody. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, we got it. And we're going to go the distance, and I'll see you all at the after party, and then we'll all go home and crash. <laughs> uh, so welcome to the talk. I appreciate you coming out. Uh, so first things first, I titled it for a developer, but really it's, it's a bit more expansive than that. It's just the tech industry as a whole. So whether or not you're a developer or a designer, I think a lot of these these things still speak to the industry at that large rather than just if you do code. Uh, and so, first of all, what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to go over some statistics, we're going to go over some of the whys, and how we can work towards changes in community. Uh, and it won't be so dry, it won't be too many statistics, just the right amount to sprinkle within. I, I, I'm biased, there you go. Um, so, hello, I'm Allison. You've already heard a little bit about me. Uh, you can follow me on social media kind of across the board, and I'll see plus. Some code, some feminism, avocado, Dolly Parton content, so be forewarned, it's a bit of a mishmash. <laughs> uh, I'm a feminist, I'm a writer, I'm obviously a mental health advocate, uh, many things. And one of the things that uh, I want to go over before we dive in is that I don't know if anyone is familiar with the podcast called Struggle Less. Uh, it's a podcast about feels, so it's like right up my alley. It's definitely my wheelhouse. Uh, but they have kind of a, a disclaimer at the beginning. So I'm not a doctor, psychologist, uh, trained health professional, that matter. Um, I'm just someone with good experience with mental health. Uh, so my qualifications are that I have a lot of feelings and opinions. <laughs> <laughs> and so neither of those are a substitute for professional guidance. Uh, so in some of my content does go into my personal story uh, and symptoms, and as such, I am aware that like depending on your own experience or where you're at or your own or your own history it could be potentially triggering. So if you realize at some point this talk is just not your jam, you're just not feeling it, feel free to exit. You're not gonna upset me. Don't feel pressured to stay. <laughs> um, I won't be offended at that at all. You just have to do you do you and take care of yourself. Uh, so a little bit more about me and my motivations in bringing this topic to the forefront. I didn't always work in tech, my background is in the arts. I had sort of a smattering of different job titles before I found them in tech. I was a hula hoop teacher, I managed a puppet studio. Uh, <laughs> it's a winding road, so clearly I just code, that made sense, right? That's just a direct line from puppets to code. Um, but I'm here because I want to help people feel less alone. I think it's not something that's discussed enough. I want to break down the stigma of talking about mental health, and I want to bring it more to the forefront of the community, especially within tech, because in tech I find that there are certain things that are normalized and brought, uh, brought forward as the standard, which don't necessarily need to be, and that don't benefit people in the long term as far as sustainability. Uh, so as mentioned, I have lived experience with mental health. It started when I was a teenager, uh, and for a while, it was written off as like typical teenage angst, I would say. So sort of just like, oh, check out this pill. <laughs> it's just like Allison having having that like angsty testing of boundaries time, shall we say? Um, and being a teenager, granted, is certainly not an easy road, regardless of whether or not you're dealing with additional issues. Uh, but I thought that what I was feeling was normal because. People around me normalized it as a, as a phase that eventually would be over, which was good news for me at the time, but unfortunately, it wasn't taken seriously in the way that I got immediate support and help. That being said, uh, I was lucky enough and privileged enough that my support systems eventually were like, no, she's not, this isn't shifting and it's getting worse and worse. 
Uh, and I was, I thought that the thoughts of like suicidal ideation and things that I was thinking were normal, and I just thought that I wasn't as strong as everyone else was. Because everyone was just like, this is a typical teenage thing. And I just was thinking, well, everyone else must be having these thoughts too, and they're just dealing with it fine. They're like trying out for teams, they're they're just dealing with it. And for some reason I'm not able to. In reality, what I didn't realize is that well, my thoughts were much different than like a typical teenage thought process, and it was much more further than angst and, and all that. But that being said, I immediately internalized the, oh, it's just me, like I'm just not strong enough to deal with whatever else seems to be fine then, like part of the course. Uh, and once diagnosed, things became even a little more complicated. I was lucky enough to receive a diagnosis, which I know there's a, a bit of pros and cons to receiving diagnosis from many people. Uh, like being put in a box is necessarily not necessarily an ideal, but it's for me it was a beneficial thing because I my mindset was like I was raised that like oh once once you give a name to something it's it's a lot more clear like where you can take it it's a lot more clear like where we can move with this and there's probably a solution and something to like again debug <laughs> I'm like oh I I can figure this out now um, but the adults around me. Their reaction was more complicated because basically I was told to not talk about it with anyone. Just was like, okay, well now you have this thing, but like don't tell anyone about it. Don't mention it on your in your college essay or like applications. Don't no, just like keep this theory. And it, they did it from a place of love because they knew that potential reactions and how people react, but also. Having, having that imposed on you from grown-ups in your life has like a long-lasting effect as far as where you then take that experience and again that internalization of the stigma of like oh wait we, we're not supposed to talk about these things it's just something that maybe you talk about with your doctor if you're lucky and then you move on and just sort of cope with it as you go. Uh, so I was told not to discuss it with anyone and that obviously had a lasting effect on my openness around it. So all of a sudden I had this issue and I wanted to work towards solving it, or solving it, <laughs> uh, but instead I had to keep quiet about it, and so that just added to the soft stigma. Uh, and so I had this diagnosis, or diagnoses, um, and but within that, I just, I feel like, and this kind of goes into um, the tech industry as a whole as well as far as identity, uh, we're so reliant on our brains for our day to day. Uh, and that's that's how we make our money is we get to solve puzzles, get to the bottom of problems, like just really like get get to the bottom of untangling these different things. But we're also so much more than that. So it's like we have these different parts of our identities that don't necessarily come up in our day to day as we code or as we design or as we project manage. But there are these these things that do come into play. Whereas like I'm more than just my diagnoses. I'm someone with depression, with anxiety, with bipolar, but I'm also all these other things. Um, and so since there's, with, as with many people with mental health issues, and I have to acknowledge here that it's important to remember that mental health issues could be a diagnosis or it could be situational based. You could have had a loss, it could be something that's less what they would maybe term long term or chronic or ongoing and more situational. And that's still something that you don't necessarily need a quote-unquote proper diagnosis for, and it's still a very valid experience. Um, so, like most people, um, there have been many ups and downs to add to this story. So, most recently, a few years ago, um, I had a relapse which resulted in me attempting suicide and being hospitalized. Uh, and that was a major wake-up call for me, because I realized that I needed to my vigilance around my self care and be a lot more aware as far as outside influences as well as my what I was like promoting outward, I would say, for self care and maintaining a certain level of calm in my own life and making deliberate choices and how, like, how I would carry those out in actual actions rather than being like, my core values are, you know, X, Y, and Z or Z. <laughs> <laughs> I need to come to Toronto. <laughs> Um, so my core values are X, Y, and Z, and I, how do I want to relate those forward in actual and actionable tasks? And so that being said, all 
all the effort has been worth it. I've had so many good times in the past few years. I traveled to Europe and I saw my brother get married. Mm -hmm. I have a niece now. Um, I celebrated my grandma's 100th birthday. I saw Dolly Parton in concert, which was maybe the closest to a religious experience I'll ever have. <laughs> um, and I think none of these things I would have seen as possible when I was in the depths of, of that place, of that darkness. Uh, and it's important to me because I deal with it every day, and it also adds additional shifts to my day to day. And it did when I worked for an agency. It did when I worked for a small business, and it still does now that I work for myself. Uh, and more so, I noticed it when I moved into the tech space because not all of those, the expectations of the tech space were not necessarily drastically different than that of, say, like another, like a bank or another type of industry, but there were certain expectations there that made it even more difficult for me to adapt into and bring those elements of self-care into play. Uh, and it's also important, and I think it's, I, I just want everyone to talk about it more because I think, I know it's not just me, um, and I know that the first step is having these conversations and teaching people the vocabulary that, of how to talk about it and how to feel comfortable talking about it. Because that, that's the case a lot of the times, so people just don't know where to begin, even though we kind of can identify the people that's like, oh, I know that these are the, my safe people to have these conversations with. But the, the people that you also know are safe, but they just don't have the intel to, to take it further. Uh, so the stats. So even beyond our communities and beyond the tech industry, these are prevalent issues that just aren't being talked about. Uh, so one in five, that's the number of adults who are living with a mental illness at any given point in time. And that's not necessarily diagnosed, it could also be situational. Uh, so chances are if you don't consciously know someone in your life. I can be your one in five. Hi, I'm Allison. <laughs> now we're friends. <laughs> um, out of the 500,000 people miss work each week due to mental health issue. And that's a lot of missing work. And, and these are just, keep in mind that all these statistics are from uh, people volunteering this information. So these are people who are owning up to this rather than the actual statistics. So this could very well be a fraction of the actual people who are, are not owning up to the actual reasons they're missing work. Uh, so more than, it's estimated that more than $50 billion uh, is the cost of the absenteeism and productivity. Uh, so better health entails lower total medical costs. And even if we don't want to, I don't want to make a blatant statement, but I'm about to. Since we're all at a work camp, I feel like we're real human to human people as far as relating to empathy. And even if you don't want to take it as a, on a person to person caring level, the cost of doing business, you're, you're losing money by not supporting these values and endeavors within your employees. It benefits your employees to know that their contributions are valued and in a way where they're able to take care of their own needs. And so they can actually keep contributing back to your business, a sense of purpose. Uh, so why do we want to talk about it? We don't want people to think we're less than. And I totally get that. I don't win this duffel, this upside down. Like, that's embarrassing. <laughs> I feel like I should have at least tried that. Um, but we don't want people to think we don't know things. And so so much of our, so much of our, Self-worth can often be tied to what we do, and it's about knowing code, about knowing we're positioning ourselves as the experts amongst our team. Um, the truth is, is that no one can know all the things, and most of the time it would be super creepy if, if you didn't know all the things. It'd be kind of rough to hang out with you. <laughs> um, and we all have our different strengths and weaknesses, and that's what makes a strong team a strong team, is being able to fill in those gaps and collaborate. And moments of varying lengths where we all doubt our capabilities and our other team members are able to like lift us up in those moments and show us our strengths. So people aren't used to talking about it, like I mentioned, because they aren't quite sure where to begin, what questions to ask, or if it's okay to discuss with you. And also, if I can point out that sometimes it's not appropriate to talk about in the workplace. Like it's not, it's not your place to be asking those personal questions. 
and depending on team structure and everything, like it, it just might not be an appropriate thing. That being said, there's a difference between like being a bit intrusive <laughs> and then or just asking someone how they're doing. And like genuinely caring and having them be like, you know what I'm having? Like I'm having a rough day. Or having someone be to vocalize, oh like are you feeling better? Yeah, I was having a rough mental health day, but I I took the day off and now I'm back in business. Like because I wouldn't have any issue being like, oh I had a migraine and I couldn't come in. But having that extra comfort to be able to say, yeah, I just I really needed to take a day for myself, but now I'm back and ready, like ready to go. Uh, the stigma of mental illness is that it comes with a sense of that you shouldn't have it to be. Uh, so that it's a bit self-indulgent, or emotional competence, or lazy, I don't know, there's like tons of negative messages we get attached to it. Uh, so, and oftentimes, without the invisibility of it, um, without physical signs and symptoms, people don't make those connections, because we're so used to needing to see something to have to be able to prove it. And again, that being said, so much physical symptoms can, be, can manifest from actual mental health. So awkward audience participation. I saw so many people's face drop when this slide came up. <laughs> um, don't worry, this is not that participatory. Uh, so how many people here wear contacts for glasses? I can see some of you wearing glasses, so don't feel like you can hide from me because I too am wearing my glasses today. <laughs> um, so has anyone ever asked you, have you just tried staring harder? Have you tried squinting? And then you wouldn't need glasses. <laughs> and that is a bit of a reach as far as comparison. But as far as people approaching you and being like, oh, I mean, like, I, I've had people be like, well, have you, have you just tried being happy? And I was like, no. <laughs> I knew I forgot something. <laughs> Darn. I've also had people ask me if I've ever heard of kale, which is. That was a hilarious one for me because also I'm just like, how can you not have heard of kale at this point? It's, it's everywhere. I enjoyed a kale salad for lunch. It was delicious. Um, I'm not anti kale, by the way. <laughs> On the record. Uh, so, anyway, a bit of a reach, but that's the sort of similarity of, of we have expectations of, of certain things being fixable and certain things not. We take glasses, it's like, of course, you have glasses, you need some correctional. And we move on. It's not. It's not anything to to uh, squint harder. It's not more. Um, of these and other statistics, the other statistics are also all available on OzzyHealth.org. And I'm not a designer, so excuse this dramatic border radius. <laughs> it's a bit much. I'm realizing. Um, so these statistics are from these statistics are from the 2016 survey. Uh, we're still processing the 2017. Uh, this is Hedger, where we formally discussed mental health, uh, like as a wellness campaign or any other official communication. And then the most places that have been in the support now. Um, so most employers haven't instigated a formal conversation. They don't have a policy in place. They haven't even mentioned it. And this one, note the difference in numbers between the mental and physical here, um, as well as the maybes. Because the difference in like, do you think discussing a mental health disorder with your employer versus a physical health disorder? The unsureness of how you anticipate your employer would react also is really telling to me. Because that can be really disabling when reaching out for help or support. So the things that, as someone with a mental health issue, you're entitled to under, under like, reasonable accommodation. Uh, so again, why this applies to tech? Uh, a high turnover rate and people burning out is not sustainable. Uh, the industry is expanding at an incredible rate, which is great, or I think it's great. <laughs> um, but it needs people who are experienced to keep those wheels in motion, and people who are experienced to maintain levels of effectiveness in order to keep continued knowledge sharing. Uh, the tech industry won't be able to rely on an influx of new developers who work pedal to the metal work so hard, get burned out, and then never get to the level of passing it forward and being senior devs and lead devs and passing down that knowledge to, to the new tech people. Uh, so there are many elements of the tech industry that specifically uh, 
lead to, let's say, potential stressors, compressed deadlines, ambitious goal setting. Uh, certain stages last in longer than anticipated, so your trust is delayed, but then your deadlines don't shift for some reason. And the assets or feedback aren't given, but those expectations still stay in place. Uh, ambitious goal setting, so working towards meeting goals that are outside of your comfort zone, whether that's skills related or time related. Uh, the constant review of work is something that I think comes up across the board, whether um, you're a designer or a developer. Uh, when you're personally invested in your work, a review doesn't have to be a bad thing, but how the review is handled and having that constant scrutiny. It's really important to have it handled in a certain way and have that really clear cut communication. Uh, especially for freelance or remote workers, uh, infrequent feedback can really translate to self doubt as well. So if you're not, if you're kind of in your own little vortex, you can get real unsure, real fast about the current state of things because you don't have that that present feedback. Also, because we work in technology, people assume we're constantly connected. Um, <laughs> constantly, I I have to admit I have flipped on until like two. Now, <laughs> I just really tried to avoid that. Um, it can feel like turning, like we're on call a lot of the time, uh, and this might pertain more to freelancers as well because work often comes in waves. And if you're in a drought, you might feel the pressure to res respond more quickly because your calls been slow. So it's the weekend, but I'm still gonna respond. Gotta, gotta get that hustle, gotta do it, gotta respond. Um, this is a quote that no one's ever said. <laughs> I totally understand all the latest technology systems and workflows within my industry. And I think that the pressure to, we're in, everything is so constantly changing, and it's important to keep up on the current state of things, but it's also like drinking from a fire hose. You really have to pick and choose your niche. Things are really interesting and inspire you. Otherwise, you'll get overwhelmed, and by picking and choosing, you just basically won't choose, you won't choose anything by choosing nothing. I think that's what I mean. <laughs> uh, so what is burnout? Uh, I have the opinion that burnout, has, has anyone of you heard the term burnout floating around? Yes. Um, I'm of the opinion that burnout is kind of a term that's masquerading as terms for larger mental health issues, but we, it's easier to say burnout. It's just, even though it's often depression, anxiety, and stress based usually. Uh, so it can be attributed to just one component. It can be a combination of many different things. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a diagnosable thing. Um, it's more likely when employees are in situations where they expect too much of themselves, they never feel the work that they're doing is good enough, feelings of inadequacy, feeling underappreciated, having unreasonable demands placed upon them, and our roles that just aren't a good fit. Uh, diminished ability to take pleasure from activities, uh, difficulty absorbing new information, uh, poor executive function, and that, that worsening short-term memory, and also a lower ability to handle stress and issues that you might normally wouldn't face from. Uh, this and this can connect with physical manifestations, so fatigue, headaches, irritability, uh, reduced efficiency, and then increased errors. So burnout is more acceptable than symptoms of mental illness generally. And one of the things with the tech industry is that hard work begetting passion is overemphasized. I'm really passionate about code. I love it, but I also like to do other things at the end of the day. And I still care about code, and I'm still super passionate. But I do like to poke out. <laughs> uh, the stigma is taking time to recharge on vacation, to take those healthy breaks, to go step out and get a breath of fresh air. Uh, those people's jobs become their identity. And so more and more when time for themselves isn't supported or encouraged. Uh, that it's a slippery slope when you let those happen. Okay, so uh, Google did some interesting studies about like what makes a good team, and these were their five keys to a successful team: psychological safety, dependability, structure and clarity, meaning of work, and impact of work. Now most of those are sort of self-explanatory, but psychological safety is one 
that we'll get into a bit later. Uh, so for this, um, these are just a pretty good binary, true code fashion, of four job resources and good job resources. Uh, so for instance, lack of social support, the job control, of not getting enough feedback, there's still time pressure again. Good job resources, there's participation, there's a variety of things, you have autonomy over the choices that you're making, potential for qualification, and support from colleagues. Uh, so there are ways of keeping up that don't involve burnout. Yes. <laughs> the strategies that we can implement to those experiencing ongoing mental health issues also support those who are experiencing burnout or are on the verge of burnout. Um, and those often overlap, like this yes. So here are some strategy suggestions. So it's important for psychological safety. You want to, oh, that's fun. Uh, so you want to be clear that there are areas that still require explanation and that each team member's input matters. You want to create things that, this is a puzzle, this isn't a new problem or a need problem, it's just a puzzle to solve. Uh, a combination of psychological safety and accountability is vital for teams to achieve their full potential. Um, and it's really important, and one of like, my favorite leaders in all of my jobs have done the modeling curiosity. They've asked a lot of questions, as well as they've acknowledged their own problem. There's nothing I love more than working with people who are like, I don't remember how to do that. I need to Google it. And just being like, yes, because we're all Googling. No way. <laughs> uh, so you want to put on your own oxygen mask first. And that's an important thing to remember uh, for helping those around you. You want to set boundaries. Know the perks and benefits available to you as an employee. Take your vacation, please. <laughs> Um, it always came down to me when I worked with people who didn't take all their vacation days. <laughs> um, communicate empathy and improve and model your self care strategies. And I think that's the most important, especially if it's modeled from the top down. Uh, to be of proper use to others, you need to sustain yourself first. Learning to be comfortable with saying that uh, is also a good gift about your this is, don't worry, I'm not going to read it all, TLDR, I just was like, I can't choose just one thing. <laughs> um, basically, to sum up, to give more effectively, prioritize your strengths and energy in a way that amplifies your efforts. So, to help someone to the maximum that I would like to help them, I have to conserve my energy in other ways, and then I'm most efficient in the ways that I do want to help people. I do remember reading it later, but <laughs> glad I'm through. <laughs> Uh, so some freelance strategies. Uh, set aside time for learning. Uh, something I do as a freelancer is I set up aside a chunk of time. It's usually on um, Friday mornings or afternoons at the end of the week, where I set aside and I schedule the things that interest me that I want to. It's Gutenberg, so be it. <laughs> it has been lately. <laughs> um, because otherwise, I don't I don't have the tenacity to do it out of hours and be sustainable as a, as a person and still maintain. So as I'm integrating it in part of my work day, I, I feel like not only am I respecting those boundaries for myself, but I'm teaching it as work to myself, and I also take it more seriously, versus that like puttering learning that kind of can trail off into the evening cameras. Uh, switch up working environments, co-working space maybe, a different coffee shop is really important. Also non-barista interaction, very important. <laughs> Keep up regular social engagements with, I refer to my non tech friends as civilians. <laughs> but like, some civilian interaction goes a long way, whether or not it's just like you meet up for a walk after work. And let's see, let's see. I'm a brief interaction. Um, client boundaries regarding communication. Choose one, stick to it. I have friends of friends who text, email, Basecamp, Slack, all with the same client. No, 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 just choose one. <laughs> also, this texting business, don't text your clients. Just keep it all in like a nice thread somewhere. Like, <laughs> concerns me. Um, seek out professional support. If you don't have a little nice little pod of people as a freelancer, uh, I totally recommend it. If once you're in that vortex, you just want to reach out to someone and be like, I need help with this issue, or like, oh, it's been slow lately, what am I doing? And again, get that. Uh, similar to remote work, it's easy for seeds of doubt to grow. Uh, 
um, when we're working within our own little bubbles. And so that building of community, it's difficult to know what's normal or not. So you need to set the pace. You need to set your own normal and know what's right for you. Uh, so employee strategies. Um, lunch and learns or training sessions. So the expectations of you keeping up to pace with the industry aren't placed outside of hours. Uh, Pre-mortems and blameless post-mortems from projects. Pre-mortems being like the project management stage where you talk about potential stumbling blocks and things that you're worried about, things that you want to go over ahead of time that concern you, and then post-mortems where it's just like, well, it's no one's fault, you actually do create a real safe space. Uh, respectful code reviews, celebrating non-feature work. So even if it's not something that you necessarily would be like, check out this Jazz feature, just celebrating everybody's work, even if it wasn't particularly jazzy. Um, create a dialogue with management is probably the most important thing. And management modeling the behaviors. So management taking a mental health day, that must be huge to me. Like, that would be such a great sign. Also, something else is fight for the future. So if your company can maybe do that and have that be part of their continued learning track, that would be amazing. Uh, so what can we do as a community? It's kind of reminds me of Lord of the Rings. Maybe it might have been. So we can embrace neurodiversity, challenge stigma talking about feelings, reduce stigma by education and disclosure, and support others in a sustainable fashion. Uh, and some of these strategies hopefully Stigma excludes and prevents people from reaching out for help. And everybody needs such range of different uh, types of help. So, and no support needs to poor treatment outcomes and, and, and quality of life. And none of that is really what we want for our friends, our colleagues, our family. Uh, by creating spaces where it's okay for people to be vulnerable and to approach people for help and ask for those supports, we can then work on strengthening the supports that are uh, so, I volunteer for an organization called Open Sourcing Mental Illness, and they do have some great resources. They have forums, and then they also have these three booklets that are geared towards employees, employers, and then your HR professionals. And they're donate what you can, I believe, online, um, but they are really helpful as far as potential guidelines, and I know that management in particular has found them generally helpful because they often don't know where to begin, so it's a nice starting point. Yeah, so if something feels off, uh, it's worth taking the time to evaluate the issue, whether you're dealing with something that's more long-term or if it's situational or symptoms of a larger issue. It's important to take some time to look into it and reach out for support because you deserve to be happy and healthy. Because um, we're not just code, we're community. I don't care about everybody, it's not all about feels. <laughs> um, these are my resources. Uh, and if if you're in need of further resources, I also have like crazy amounts of academic documentation. <laughs> um, I need to add a Google one, I realize, to this list. Uh, yeah, if you're in need of resources for something specific, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, thank you. And also, um, as an introvert, I also realized that like, I was also say, any questions? I'm never the person that asks questions at the end of the talk, but I will be around after this and then at the after party so if you do have a question. Or if you just want to fly totally anonymous, you can like email or tweet at me. I don't even need to know it's you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, thank you for coming. Literally two minutes. <laughs> Literally two minutes. Oh, and yeah, please take a sticker if you want them. So we do have time for QA. Any other questions? I didn't mean to scare people off of questions. <laughs> I hear a lot of questions, then go for it. What's WP Hugs? WP Hugs. Yeah. WordPress Hugs is something started by a guy named Leo from South Africa. Um, and there's a Slack channel, and it's specifically for WordPress and mental health. Yeah. And it's a bit slow right now, but I think it's because it's a, kind of a small group of people, and then I think we all kind of got busy. <laughs> <laughs> busy freelancers, since we haven't had much time to put back into it. But um, yeah, I recommend joining the Slack community as well. So, again, I'm quiet, but quiet but mighty. <laughs> do you find the tech industry <clears throat> might be more, I guess, like a tolerant in a bad way of individuals who might be considered like verbally abusive or emotionally abusive if they're. Rockstar developers, things like that. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do find some of the time to be more tolerant. Um, I think a lot of things. I, I think a lot of things get let like a lot of things slide um, in exchange for that rock star developer vibe. Unfortunately, uh, I don't really know the solution to it other than just like this that it's not worth it because I I feel like there are um, kinder people with the same skill set. I just don't think that they are as loud as those other people. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that oftentimes like in the pipeline that comes forth. Yeah, it's just yeah. really just some people doing a lot of bullying. Yeah, and, and I think um, something that I've heard suggested and a few of my friends' workplaces have started integrating is uh, workshops and nonviolent communication. And also because like not only does it allow those people to potentially uh, learn to communicate differently, it also really highlights the individuals that are struggling with communicating to their team members in a certain way, um, to management as well as their coworkers, when people aren't able to follow the exercises in those those patterns, and it kind of has brought some like a sense of awareness to those situations where they're like, oh, that's just so and so being so and so. I just use real names. <laughs> 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 I was like, any name I use, I'm like, oh no, <laughs> I'm not thinking of a real person. Um, if that's just so and so being so and so, it's still not tolerable because if they're not treating their their team members with the respect they deserve, it's not creating that psychological safety at all. And if you feel that any suggestion that you bring to the table is going to be critiqued, why would you even bring a potential problem to the forefront if you know that you're immediately going to something's like, oh, I don't see you're going to be, if you're going to be blamed potentially, it's like, well, I'm not even going to tell them this is going to be a problem down the line. Like, it's not a safe space. I think it also, too, is indicative of us to, as employees, to be more tolerant of dealing with people like that in our industry mm -hmm. and sticking around in places like that too long um, versus saying, you know, management is not. Dealing with this, mm -hmm. I should look for something else. Yeah. I think I know I personally have stuck around too long in places like that where I really should have left because the environment wasn't indicative to what I want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've done the same work. And there's there's a difference as well between because you stick around and like perhaps excuse me, perhaps you've like voiced concerns and you want to see change, so it's like you have that like little give where you're like, okay, well I'm gonna wait to see what's instigated and what actually happens. But then it's, I've also been in a situation where you do that and you wait and you're like, okay, I'm gonna put my patient's hat on, like give them a minute. But when change isn't actually instigated, then I make the mistake of still sticking around because it's just, I don't know, it's maybe just have the, it's, it's more painful to see the potential for change and just not have them follow through on it when you're happy in, in other ways rather than that one thing. Ugh. But yeah, it definitely has to. There's, there's so much that has to come from, I believe, like the management level to, to trickle down, unfortunately. Like whether it's modeling behaviors or the, the tolerance level of, of, of certain types of communication or mannerisms. I mean, like, I'm going to lay the mic to what you're saying. I had the owner of your company work for say, I would never want to work for your boss. He's so cruel and nasty. I wouldn't yeah. want to work for him. Like, but you expect me to. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, this is a conundrum. <laughs> that's and the, and that's an interesting that's an interesting it's an interesting thing to publicly tell you. <laughs> because the fact that they would want to hire someone and they see that the value like to because to them there's value there somewhere. But to have that somehow I don't know. It's not overpowered by those other things that are so clearly negative, which is interesting. And that's the, I guess, the like finding a place where the values are actionable and they're actually like, walking the walk that they talk rather than just talking and then to know the parent and Helen, do you have any questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. How do you bring them to like a, a spot to your boss? How do you as far as more mental health awareness? Yeah. 
I would totally recommend open source mental illnesses handouts for that. It's a good kind of, um, I would say like a non-confrontational way of just being like, hey, here are these, here are these things, and it doesn't, it doesn't become a personal issue so much as like these are some things that falls in line with like the nation standards of like reasonable accommodation, and like I wanted HR to like, know more about it. Um, or you can have me send it to the law anonymously, which I've totally done for people. Um, I'm like, hi, I'm part of Osmond's outreach team. <laughs> um, but I find that to be good because if if there's nerves around opening the conversation from the beginning, um, it's really great to present it just from a standpoint of like, hey, I thought this was really cool for the company as a whole, rather than making it more of an individual, like pointing fingers or whatever. It just feels more safe, I think, for everybody. And they don't feel also that you're critiquing how they are around doing things. Thank you very much.